Good night. Arrow key. Good evening, everyone. Those of you who don't know, my name is Bill Jowers. Um, I'm a master gardener with the University of North Carolina. Uh, New, uh, so I'm sorry, NC, North Carolina State University. I live here now. I'm not doing much with that, but I do still have the desire to uh, do what I used to have to do with volunteering, giving presentations, and those sorts of things. I've been doing verbal culture for a long time. I've been interested for a long time. I've traveled to many seminars and um, I've met with a lot of science science people who do this as research work. And part of being a master gardener is the realization we have to do everything. It has to be research-based. So I can't stand up here and give you information that's not been researched and documented. That's part of the charter of a master gardener. Um, most everything that I've ever done has been looked at by, I mean, the doctorates and everything, because that's what they do as an inner, inner group. Okay, um, this was the very first presentation I ever created for vermiculture. Okay, I have my note sheets up here. This um, vermiculture is nothing new. It's thousands of years they've been doing it. Um, 400 AD, there was a, a agronomist named uh, Vero, Roman, and he described a technique for getting more product for the troops to feed them by taking all the manure and burying it in a hole and then covering it with um, leaves and that sort of thing, dirt, and basically was vermicomposting, okay? Uh, so it's nothing new. Um, it's come to light more and more in the past 30 or 40 years that it's very beneficial to the environment. Um, and so this is the beginning of time we've been doing this, okay? Down or over? Okay. Um, a very long time ago, you all, I'm sure you're all familiar with Charles Darwin, the origin of species uh, author. Well, he also was uh, researched uh, earthworms. And excuse me one sec. Charles Darwin published a book. Um, but what he did, what he made the statement was something that everyone should understand and realize is a fact. And I'll read it to you. You can see it yourself. All the fertile areas of this planet have at least once passed through the bodies of earthworms. Those are facts. That's how that's how Earth has been sustained for millennia, is by the earthworms burrowing, aerating the soil, eating the garbage, and generating nutrients through their, their casings, if you will. Okay, this is the book he wrote. It's called the formation of vegetable mold, mold. The formation of vegetable mold through the action of worms, with observations of their habits. This is what the book looks like. I have one, and one of you out there has one. As soon as you pull the ticket, who wants to pull the ticket? Charles Darwin believed that worms could think and process information. I don't know if that's true, but he believed it. If you if you were to read this book, it's pretty fascinating. Nobody got it. <laughs> anyway, I want one of you to have one of these books. There's two of them there. You take the one you want, the hard cover, the paper cover, your choice. Just let me know when you find your Yeah. 
Okay. Um, we'll start out with the basics. Earthworms are vital for soils and soil life, the life cycle. <clears throat> Without earthworms, you, can re you have a dead zone in your garden or eaten anywhere on the planet. Obviously, the deserts don't have them, but they're dead zones. Some interesting statistics. Uh, worms can eat their weight in organic matter in one day. The worm casts, which are their manure, contain more micro microorganisms than the food they eat. In the science presentation, they call this the uh, um, uh, Cinderella effect. I'll talk about that in another presentation. And worm casts contain no, pat no disease pathogens. They have the, the ability to take pathogens out of the soil um, and they can do it effectively. And before you know it, if you've got toxic soils, the earthworms can clean them up in a, 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 in a certain amount of time, depending on the severity, the depth of those items. They also till the soil while they're working as part of their unique thing about them. Okay, the types of earthworms. There's a garden of the field earthworm. I don't, I can't pronounce that name, but you can see it, okay. Those are not good for composting. They don't take good to captivity and they also tunnel vertically. I'm sorry, horizontally. They're more of a fishing worm. Well, the red wiggles are fishing worms as well. Yeah. Uh, any worm can be a fishing worm. In fact, a lot of the people. The, uh, the yeah. Part. Yeah. The, um, a lot of the people who do vermiculture. Don't do it for vermicomposting. They do it to raise worms. I was surprised at that, but I found a lot of the people are doing it just for the worms, not understanding what they're creating in addition to that. But these are the two rooms you use. Normally, the one you'll find is going to be the little, 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 the, the first one. Okay, <laughs> that's the normal one you, you will buy if you buy them on the internet, and you can find these on the internet anywhere you want. Okay, yeah, field worms just don't do well in captivity at all. Plus, they don't tunnel properly because they go horizontal. The real earthworms that that, um, that create compost, they tunnel vertically. And they create, as they go up, they, everything drops below them. And they create the, the secretions that are, are known as compost. Okay, the garden of the field earthworm. They prefer eating and tunneling in ordinary soil, which is not what we're looking for. And on a good acre of land, there'll be approximately 500,000 earthworms. That sounds like a lot, but that's the real number. On a properly maintained acre of land, that's about what you should have. And that would cycle about, recycle about five tons of soil, which means they tunnel through it, site recycling that soil as they're, as they're working. And their intestinal secretions concentrate nutrients for easier nutrient, I mean, easier plant uptake. The plants um, take very well to these things because they're natural fertilizer. It's nothing that's been put in the soil. Um, plants don't know the difference between you, what, something you make and something you provide in this form, but they may not know it intentionally, but their, their system knows it. They realize it's, it's, it's a, it uptakes better than a, a synthetic, if you will, putting it that way easier. Okay. Attracting and keeping earthworms do's and don'ts. I'm using earthworms here as a, a just an overall catch-all term, okay? One thing, do never use chemical fertilizers. Do not use chemical insecticides. Don't use chemical herbicides. And the one key thing here, don't till the soil. You till the soil, you, you grind up your worms, okay? Now, there's a process I used to do in my gardens called double digging. You may or may not be aware of what that is. You dig a trench, you dig another trench next to it, throw everything into that trench, okay? Um, but if you till the soil, that's one of the reasons that a lot of, we have a lot of dead zones in the country because they go through with giant tilling machines every year and grind the soil up. So you know no earthworms can live in that environment. And these are so, so simple and basic to do and you'll have great results by doing it. Okay, you want to attract and keep earthworms, the dews. Uh, add organic matter to the soil, and that's any kind of organic matter. Keep grass and cover crops growing, 
double mow the clippings. Um, you know, double mowing, you mow them, then mow them again, so you get a smaller, smaller uh, clippings. Uh, regular grass clippings are a certain size, but if you go over them a couple of times, pretty soon it turns to nothing and goes into the soil. And they'll that's what you want in your soil. Um, keep it well drained. And also cover crops help. And you do leave your grass clippings on the ground. Don't rake them up. Leave them on the ground. Let them. If you double mow them, they won't they won't rot on you. Okay. And all these things are simple to do. Okay. Those are earthworms. Now the red wigglers prefer compost and manure piles. And even though what I was telling you, the earthworms don't do the composting, they're still vital to your soil vitality. Okay. They're just not composting worms. Um, the red wigglers, which is the composting worm, they prefer compost and manure piles. But they break down the foods in the organic uh, waste and, and organic matter, food waste. And what they excrete is rich compost called vermicompost. Um, it's very high in nutrients. I have a, a chart in here in a little while. And if you dig under any manure pile you find, they will find it. Something else I've found through my own experimentation is that, and I was going to suggest this for um, Bancroft. I found, I used to take and save all my newspapers. I, I read newspapers. I like to read the hard copy. So I would save them all and I would put them in a wheelbarrow, soak them. And I would lay them everywhere for compost, not for composting, for weeds, thick. Thick piles of newspaper over your garden area. And I will tell you, eventually you will have worms under there because it's moist. Uh, someone made a joke one time when I was doing a presentation. They said, why they want to get there and get and read the newspaper. Well, they're not reading the newspaper, okay? <laughs> so don't even go there. They'll eat your newspaper. They will eat it. Exactly right. They will. And that's one of the things you put in your compost bin is wet newspaper. I, I feed them uh, I feed them some of the San Diego Reader without the click pages. Yeah, you don't. Yeah, 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 because all ink now is soy-based except the color. Don't put colored paper in there. As long as it's black, black and white, you can put anything you want in the garden. So it won't hurt anything. It'll break down, sir. The Washington compost? It's possible. I prefer the New York Times compost myself. But... <laughs> yeah. Anyway, the um, their intestinal cre uh, secretions concentrate n nutrients. Uh, and that makes the plants get more. When they take up nutrients, they get a higher quality of uh, nutrient going into the plant. Very rich. When I do a lot of my transplants, I use uh, saplings as part of the uh, transplant mix mm -hmm. because of the mycorrhiza yep. to help overcome, um, I mean, to add the root nodules and things to Correct. become a transplant shop. That's, that's a good idea, actually. They've Research has shown that if you take a small piece, you know about a golf ball size we'd recommend normally, um, as that plant grows, and uh, research has found that you take a small plant, as it grows the roots out through there, at the very end of those roots, there's still uh, microcompost on that root. It takes it with it. It carries it through the soil with it as part of the nutrient uh, uptake. So it's just pretty cool stuff. Pretty cool stuff. Okay, one thing. Garden earthworms can't be raised in captivity. They, they won't last. They die. Um, vermiculture is the raising of composting worms. We're culturing the worms, okay? Vermicomposting is a result of that verm vermiculture. Okay, vermicomposting. It's using composting worms, red wigglers, and microorganisms to convert organic waste to rich, nutrient-rich humus. Humus is what you want in your soil. Humus is the rich, nutrient-rich part of your soil. And the more humus you have in your soil, the better. Most of the soils in the world basically are really low on humus. Um, researchers nowadays have to go somewhere to buy humus for research purposes, and they get it normally now in Brazil. At least the last times I was aware where they were getting it. It's hard to, you can't just go out in your garden and dig humus most of the time. We don't have it. It's been sucked up by the chemicals, insecticides, and poor uh, land management. Um, something that we've just done, okay? Oh, so you want 
humus and, and you can make your own, it will make it itself. You will get humus if you keep doing these things we're talking about tonight. Okay. Okay. The advantage of raising composting worms. Um, remembering one thing, our landfills are way over overburdened. Everybody knows that. Um, some localities, and I found this out when I was working with some Canadian uh, people, in Can and someplace in Canada and even up in the North, North America and no Northern states, you have to tag your garbage and you have to pay for the weight that they take. Canada and apartment buildings, they, um, they weigh your garbage and they charge you how much you throw away because the landfill is so overburdened. Um, I, can, I know in Toronto, Canada, people I know there, their guard, they take their garbage to Michigan to bury it, right? And like I say, they call it way and pay. That's what they're doing to take your garbage. Now, the, some people that I've know and met who are Canadians and involved in this same thing are starting to get people in their homes to put in small composting from composting bins in their in their kitchen. Now, properly done, it won't get anaerobic and smell. Properly done. Um, when I first first time I got a, a composting bin, the first one I ever put in my kitchen, my wife who is now deceased was not particularly happy, I can assure you. Um, that's even putting it mildly. But after a while, when she saw we had big garden, I had big, big gardens and big composts. And after a while she started realizing she wasn't have to, doing a lot of strange things, getting rid of trash. And it didn't smell. The worms weren't crawling out and crawling across the floor. You know, she thought for sure they're going to come out and walk in the kitchen one night, slip on a worm. That doesn't happen. And after a while, it was like it was an accepted part of our kitchen. It was a, it's in a corner where there was a, a verma or composting bin. And uh, it, we had it for years. We had those. But I had, I had big... Big, uh, big ones also because I was doing it as a as a business for a small for an amount of time, and uh, yeah, it, that's a, it's a good thing because and that's why they're trying to do this in Canada. You can get rid of a huge amount of your waste if you eat lots of vegetables and that anything can be put into the worm bin. And something I tell people when I, I teach class on composting, regular composting, everything will compost better if you freeze it first because it per bursts all of the water in the cell structures. Banana peels take forever to compost. Freeze them and throw them in a compost. They're gone in a few days. Okay? So freeze anything before you compost it. You'll have a huge, huge success by doing that. Okay, I mean, raising these composting worms reduce your landfill contribution and it produces ca castings for soil amendment, which you can harvest. And it produces a vermicompost for soil amendment as well. And then you can also make a worm tea for fertilizers. Um, it's, the, the science behind the worm tea is, is phenomenal. The, um, if you spray worm tea on plants, beneficial insects are more attracted to them and they stay longer. Um, I, I fold your feet all of my garden. When I gar was gardening big, I always fold, fold your fed everything. And I put you know, vermicompost in the ground. And regular compost, and if you do that with uh, composting tea, the, this tea, incredible difference. Um, there's a fellow that I know up in New York who's got a five-acre garlic farm that he sells garlic, organic garlic, to restaurants. And by using the, the compost and the and the spray, he's getting harvest three weeks earlier than anybody else who's raising garlic. And he's selling that garlic in New York City weeks before anyone else can even get a bulb out of the ground. So there's things like that that really make a difference that people are paying attention and the researchers are finding this out. And it's pretty interesting some of the things that they are finding out by the studies they're doing. Okay, worm compost is very high in humic acid. And humic acid, which dissolves the minerals in the soil that plants can uptake. Plant can't take up a piece of rock. But when it's been dissolved by humic acid, it becomes a more it becomes available to the plant in the form they need to take it up in. Worm compost is neutral pH, and most plants prefer that neutral range, one or two, either side, generally. It also increases the water holding capability or capacities to the, of anything you put it in. It hold more water, not leak it out. 
and not be soggy, soggy. It also increased the microbial activity in the soil, as you had mentioned, which is one of the main things you want. And it has a higher nutrient quality than traditional compost. Now getting started, you want a worm bin, bedding and worms. You need a container for the worms. You've all heard that you can take a shoebox. You can take anything. Tupperware container with holes in it. Um, it's not that difficult. Buy the worms. Get them from someone you know if you want. But I bought my first worms actually with it when I bought a bin many years ago. Okay, you the worm bins. Buy it or build it. Any material. I've always preferred wood because it insulates better and stores with excess moisture. Okay. Untreated. Yes, untreated wood, absolutely untreated wood. And um, plastic will hold the moisture. Um, and any existing box could be adapted by the addition of air and drainage holes. Old dresser drawer. I know someone used an old dresser drawer. I've seen people use so many things over the years that we had these classes. Um, I've had, where I come from in North Carolina, a lot of people are into this. So I've had people stand up at these seminars like this and say, I'm using this, I'm using that. And it'd be like, you know, there'd be a dozen different ways that they're doing a vermicomposting bin based on just what they've got around. And you don't have to spend any money if you really don't want to. Okay, the bedding, they need to be damp bedding. Now, what you see here is a, a, a composting bin that I had. It's the very first one I ever bought. And... I bought and experimented with it until I got better. Then I started building my own. But basically, you need the bedding material. And it can be anything. Um, I've used shredded newspaper really successfully. It can be regular compost. I always, I never started a worm bin without at least a couple of scoops of real compost for them to get started eating. They're like a starter diet. You just throw them in there with nothing. You give them, you know, a, a big scoop of compost in there, they start eating that first. Then they're eating while you start giving them what you're going to be giving them to create more from a compost. Um, cardboard, they love cardboard, chopped straw, sawdust, coconut fiber is one I've even used. And that works pretty well. The corridor, corridor they call it. I, I have five bricks at home right now in case I want to start again. Or moss are uh, two of the best starters you can use. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I'm, I always start with newspaper. It was just easy and it was quick and everybody had it. I threw it to my shredding machine and I used to, you know, there's a book out there by Mary Applewhite called Worms Eat My Garbage. Well, I used to say worms eat my junk mail. Okay. Right. So one of the things about the cocoa fiber, it doesn't mat like paper does, which is a good thing. Paper will mat. You can, it's easy to overdo it with paper if you're not careful. I learned through experimentation and mistakes, obviously, and, if you do, newspaper works fine. And normally what I've always done is when you've got your worms in there, I would take wet newspaper and just cover it with a solid sheet of wet newspaper to keep anything from getting out and to keep it damp. So it's always damp under there. And you can leave that newspaper in a nice layer. I mean, they're going to get air through the bottom of the holes and everything, so it's not a big deal. You're not going to suffocate them. And, and you can just pick it up and look or pick it up and put more things in there. The ones I used to provide had a regular top on it. But I never use it on mine. I would just use newspaper. Okay, here's those worms again. They're readily available on the internet. These are two you'd want to use. And th these are the only ones that compost. These are the only ones that compost um, garbage. And you can just Google vermiculture, find anything you want nowadays. How much food? They eat a lot of food. Um. Normally, a pound of food, a pound of food per two pounds of worms is about right, an average. Um, the average, the average American, I think we create like four pounds of food waste a day, typically, something along those numbers. I don't remember exactly, but it's I'm sure it's changed. Um, one square foot of bin, eight to twelve inches deep, and that's what gets a good size bin for a couple of pounds of worms. Okay. Two pounds of worms in a thing that size, you can get rid of a lot of food. Okay. Freeze it, like I said, and you will not have a whole lot of problem getting rid of good food. And the worms will multiply. You'll eventually have to harvest, which we're going to talk about 
Okay. But you want to remember something. If you have a family that eats huge amounts of vegetables continuously, you may want to have more than one bin. Or what I did, I used to have to stack them, the stackable bins. The ones that I sold were two bins, a starter kit, two bins, two pounds of worms, and everything set up. Uh, when I bought mine, it's like five plastic bins. That's the first thing I used for many years until I until I got you know got to do a little better. Okay. Okay, the bedding should be like a damp sponge when you set it up. That soil or sand that helps aid in digestion because worms have a little gizzard too, just like a chicken. Okay. So you a little bit of sand or soil in there will really help them. Um, compost some sand mixed in with it and it's going to really make a big deal the squeeze test three to one by by weight water to bedding okay so you don't want it if you squeeze it out it's too wet you don't want it to be wet soggy wet damp wet is good and you'll figure it out because if it starts to mat it's too much water if it doesn't do proper you, you know it's one of those things that i can't tell you exactly three and a half cups eight ounces i can't tell you any of that okay that's why, like you had said, the cocoa nor and peat moss are also good for that reason, because they won't mat, and they'll drain water off quickly. So that's a good thing to be using. If the water squeezes out, it's too wet. Remember that always. Okay, this is actually my worm bin here, being set up from another worm bin for this uh, for this photograph. Place them on the bedding and spread them out. Now they want to get away from the light, so as long as you keep it out. They'll, they'll disappear in no time, be gone. Okay. Then you can put your top on, your cover of the wet newspaper, thick, whatever. Uh, that's that's how I've always done it. And it's always worked for me. Yeah, they don't like the light at all. And that's that's part of the harvesting as well. Okay, adding to the food waste, no meat or dairy, no bones, smaller pieces the better, spread it out evenly. And I, I, like I said, freeze it and then let it warm. Don't throw frozen in there to the worms. They're not, they're not going to like that. Something interesting here that I'll share with you that they say no meat or dairy. And that's, that's true in, 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 the, in the, the real sense. However, there have been exceptions. As I was learning to do this many years ago, I was reading an article about a University of Southern California group that was starting to learn to compost, vermicompost. They started some bins and they were taking food out of the cafeteria. They didn't, they weren't aware that they didn't have enough knowledge at that time about the dairy bones and all this. And they commented in the article that I was reading, it was in an organic magazine, that a lot of the worms loved their macaroni and cheese from the cafeteria. <laughs> well, they're not supposed to. It's not supposed to be put in there. I think mostly because it will rot. Okay. Here again, that's mostly what I feel. About the no meat or no bones. I was in a research uh, study once and someone mentioned that about it. And the, the person who was conducting the research said, if there's enough carbon content in the worm bin, you can throw meat or bone in there. So I thought to myself, right, I'm going to try this. So I had... A 55 gallon drum, plastic drum that I was using as a worm bin for my personal use. And it was pretty deep. It was probably just deep with worms and compost. So one day I went out there with a bone from, I believe it was a ham, that still had meat and gristle and fat on it. And I pulled it back and put it about eight or 10 inches below there and left it. Got a, basically forgot about it. Months later, when I was harvesting that, that thing looked like it had been dipped in acid. It was so clean. Okay. So, but there's got to be a lot of carbon. Got to be lots of leaves and paper. You know, if you just throw it in with meat, I mean, with other stuff, it'll rot. It'll get anaerobic and that will rot and kill. That'll kill the worm if they get anaerobic. And you don't want that. So these are, these are standard items for you. But knowing personally that I've done it, it can work, provided you, you know, don't get extravagant. You don't want to throw a whole cow in there. My garbage piece started to not feed orange peel right. or citrus peel. But that's not true. My worms, I feed them them and they yep. seem to do very well with it. And you know what? I, I'm, 
I was going to bring that up later, but I had the same issue. They they tell you not to, but I used to, I still do eat a lot of grapefruit. And I just, I would throw them, I chop them up, I chop them small. I chop a piece of small and throw them in there. And I never had a problem with them. They eat them. Because if you've got enough other types of food, you know, a lot of these things they tell you is because someone said, well, let's see if they'll eat grapefruit and they throw a grapefruit and nothing else. Okay. But if I believe it's like a balanced diet for a human, personally, that's how I feel. I think that they, not that they're thinking about it, but their dietary needs are a lot more complex than we want to give them credit for. So I'm like you, I throw the citrus in there. I also told avocados, didn't they not to throw those peels in there? Well, the peel may not get eaten, but I will tell you, well, you throw an avocado peel in there and go back there about three or four weeks later and take it out and open it up. The worms are cuddled in that avocado peel. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's so cool to see that because, you know, a lot of the things you're finding, they're telling you, are not necessarily true. They're based on a study somebody did with a unique set of circumstances that they created. Okay. Like citrus. All right, let's feed them nothing but citrus. No, they're all going to die. It's not worth it. But I'm like you. I'll, I'll attempt to do things, and I've done it. And I've been successful because I was careful. Because I care about, I'll be honest with you, I cared about my worms. <laughs> I mean, I really cared about it. I go out there and see how they're doing. You know? And um, not that I was, don't get me wrong, not enough. You know what I mean when I say I care about them. They're living creatures. They deserve to be respected. We're supposed to give any living creature. So anyway, on maintaining the bin, um, here again, it's a matter of keeping it loose for soil, uh, air circulation, keep it moist like we talked about. And I, mine has always been the layer of maybe half an inch, three quarters of an inch thick newspaper on top, just enough to always stay wet. Um, add garbage regularly. Don't just throw it in. A lot of people put it on one side. You know, some people put spread it out like I said on, shown on the slide, but I know you can just take and slide it over, put it in on one side, and they'll go back and forth looking for it. And don't overload it. If it starts getting to a point where there's too much left over after a while, slow down. Keep it in your freezer. Put it in your regular compost pile. But don't overfeed them because it'll get anaerobic and rot and smell. And then you got to take it out of the kitchen and your wife will hurt you. Okay? <laughs> I learned that part too. Okay, monitoring these things. As you're as you're doing this, you'll notice the soil will change. It'll eventually, it's from what you see is that rotted areas, it'll start looking really not like soil almost. Okay. Especially if you're putting the, the garbage into it on one side. I call it garbage, but you know, we know it's not. So it'll start getting darker and you'll be able to identify castings. Castings are the little egg type things. They're just they're small like a BB. And that's the eggs where they have the eggs. And if they're and it's their poop, they call it poop. And if you have a, it's funny because I'd go to have elementary school students when you go to a class, teach them something, say we give them, I'm gonna give them a handful of worm poop. You know, kids are you know oh I know you know they're just loving it by that. But you can identify those, and that's that's when you know you're getting somewhere. The bedding will shrink, okay, and, and you have to keep track of that because they'll die if it stagnates. Like any living ecosystem will adapt to the conditions around it. So if things if they start running out of food, the worms will die off till there's enough to keep the food going. You keep plenty of food, maintain an equal equilibrium, they'll continue to grow. But you do have to harvest. You have to harvest eventually. Because they'll get bigger, they'll multiply. And you always got to make sure there's enough airflow and no objectional odor. If you get any kind of odor out of it, it's anaerobic and you've got a problem and you need to fix it. Because they'll die quickly. They'll die quickly. I accidentally left my drum in just too, too long in the hot sun and went there. All the, the worms left. It was empty. It wasn't a worm left in it. It was a 55 gallon drum. They were gone because of the heat. No. They can take up to 50, 50 degree weather or so and they'll live. They won't reproduce to eat as well, but they'll still live. They won't die until they get really cold. All right, here again, here's the key. If you don't harvest them, your worms will die. There's only so much room you can be in there. There's only so many living creatures can live in that space, okay? As they eat, as they, um, as they eat, process the bedding, the garbage will become toxic to them if you're not careful. 
It'll get toxic and they'll die. You've got to fix it. So you'll find it when you start to start to um, harvest. It'll contain worms, castings, partially decomposed bedding, and partially decomposed food waste. That'll all be in there as you're harvesting. A couple of methods to do it. The number one method is to dump it and sort it. Dump the contents on a plastic sheet, put a lamp up there, and you start taking the, the worms keep going to the bottom. Just start scraping it off. Takes only a couple of minutes. And then when you get down to the bottom, there'll be mostly worms. Scoop it up, put it in a box. Here it is. Worms go to the bottom of the pile, get away from the light. You pull it away from the top, then you gather them, start another box. Pretty basic to harvest, okay? That's method one. The other one is the ongoing harvest. This is what a lot of people do. I've done this as well. Where you push it to one side as it starts getting completed, push it to the side, gather as much as you can without worms, and then just put more in there, so back out. So that's harvesting a little bit. That's the kind of harvest you want to do if you're going to make tea, because you only need about a pound of tea to five gallons of water, a pound of compost. And it's only good for 24 hours. It won't last any longer. Um, and so if you're going to do that type of thing, this method works well because you don't harvest all of it at once. You harvest a little bit here and there, back and forth. In fact, some of the, um, there was a gentleman I met years ago who had a big, big worm farm here in California. I don't know where it was, but he showed a slide of how they do. These were big. I mean, these were uh, windrows that were hundreds of feet long, 20 feet and wide, thick, tall. And they would put all their stuff in one. And when they wanted to start harvesting, all they would do, they'd stop feeding that one completely. And they would build another one and just feed, start putting food there. The worms would migrate over them. So we said so we never saw one crawl across the, the dirt, but they were over there within a while. Okay. And in um, in commercial growing of, har of uh, compost worms, they use a slurry of generally uh, manure. The ones I, I know in, in North Carolina I've been to, they bring in, uh, the one fellow I know brings in a 10,000 pound truck of cow manure from the Mountain Dairy Farm near him. And they've turned into a slurry. They let it compost down, mix with water, and they spray it on there to feed them. That's how they feed them. And then when they when they all get to the top, they scoop them off, put them in another one, take all the compost out of the bottle. He sells huge, I mean, bags, you know, the giant bags of compost there. You can buy the basically a gunny sack of compost from him. That's how he sells it. So there's a lot of it. That, that's commercial. Those are commercial people. Um, and overseas, a lot of the third world countries that are doing composting, the human waste is composted by worms. I one time, I didn't, I, I didn't want to, I would never use something like that on my own personal plants because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just funny about that. But I did for a while um, heart, uh, use my animals. I walked my animals, pick up their mess, and I started having a compost bin of just animal manure. And I use that on like roses and those plants. I didn't use it on food plants, but I used it on ornamentals, trees and things like that. And I could have used it on uh, on food plants. In some place in the country, especially on the East Coast, I know these, they're harvesting huge amounts of it, putting it in bins, and then they test it to see if it's usable. Um, they already actually use it on golf courses more and more now. They don't want to use. They don't want you to use it on food product, food crops. But people are still doing it, and they're finding it is possible to be used because the nutrients are rich and there's no contaminants in there if it's been properly made. It's a. It's kind of a. It's a touchy subject for people, but one day it's going to be they're using it all the time. Okay. Okay, the third method. Oh, we gotta be a third method. That's just divide and dump. You remove two thirds of the worms in compost and use it worms all in the garden. The worms will live in the garden. If you keep enough compost, because worms eat compost, they eat the compost. So you take, and then you just replace the bedding because then you add food waste. So as worms grow and get bigger, you take two thirds of them out or half out put them into the garden 
as as compost and then just start feeding it again and they'll grow back into it okay that's a popular way to do it it's simple you don't get real dirty doing it and um everybody's happy upward migration method this is the wet method i've always used the one on the right uh yeah it's my right the plastic that's the first one i ever you bought i bought that from a company in Washington state when I lived in North Carolina. And that's how I learned to, learn to compost was in that bin. That's called the upward migration method. And it's really the most, to me, the most effective way. On the left, you'll see the boxes that I used to build and sell. And what you, what you do is you have a box and as it gets filled up, you put another box on top of it. And you start filling that box. When they finish everything in the bottom, they'll crawl up to the next box. And you take the bottom box off and it's basically clean compost. Okay. That's the best way. It worked for me. I got a lot of compost. I even was able to sell compost after a while. Okay. And it, it works. I mean, it worked for me. Basically, here's how it works. Start the bin with a third of the bedding and food scraps. And feed everything the same as, as all the other methods. And it is converted and the volume increases. They move up to feed. Like I say, they feed vertically. So as they keep moving up, they move up. They When they're almost finished, you put the next bin on top. Take that paper off that's been holding them in. Put your in there. All the holes in the bottom. Start feeding that one. They'll crawl right up there. Within a certain amount of time, there'll be nothing left in the bottom. A few stragglers. A few scraps, but it'll be mostly gone. They crawl up. And um, you take that and that's your compost. Empty it out. And when that will start to fill, do the same thing. You only need two. I mean, the one I had had five of them. Didn't need that many, but that's what came when I bought it. But two works perfectly. And that's really the best way to do it, in my mind. Okay. Lastly, some information, some sources. Um, Wormdigest.org is incredible, actually. It's an incredible thing. Cornell has done a huge amount of research into this, Cornell University. Um, one lady that I know who was uh, one of the researchers there, she, she's now left, but she had done some incredible studies. And in my science presentation that I, I had that it accompanies this one, we won't do it tonight. Um, a lot of her work is in there. She granted me permission to use her, her data and her research numbers in that presentation. And uh, because she's a, it's a land grant university. Cornell's a land grant university, just like NC State or Cal State, wherever they're, they're land grant. So it's not a big deal. They're not looking for patents or anything like that. But uh, she did some incredible research on it. I mean, there's some interesting stuff that they've learned and, and have done. This is um, the apple hog that we talked about, that Mary Apple Hog that we both talked about, Worms Eat My Garbage. It's a cute little book to read. It's a wonderful book. It's really, really good. And I mean, it's it's the most basic thing. It works. I got it and boom, next thing you know, I was an authority. <laughs> this next one down here, an Agricultural Testament. Sir Robert Howard, who was a British agronomist who went to India. I had these books in my way. Anyway, he went to India to study uh, agriculture and try to increase yields and that sort of thing. Well, the, you, the, the method we use for composting is known as the Isidore method. And the reason it's called the Isidore method is because he was in an agricultural station. In, oh, I'm sorry. It's called the Isidore method. And the reason for that is he was in a place in India, a research station located in Isidore, India. Okay. So it's called the Isidore method. And that's the standard composting we use, piling this on, piling that on, you know, wet, brown, green, blah, blah. Um, but his book is incredibly interesting because of what, what he did with food culture and, and raising the uh, productivity just by that alone. He'd have one bin not doing anything, and it's, it was a bigger scale than we're going to do in your yard. But it's an incredible book. Um, that went out of print a while back. I didn't may have mentioned I went and bought all I could find. It's now back in print. Uh, the other two are just uh, Environmental Health Sciences, Canadian Office of Urban Agriculture, which is one of the places that they have doing the tag and bag, tag and sell, getting trying to get people to do uh, compost in their kitchen so they don't put so much garbage. That's part of the Canadian Office of Urban Agriculture doing that. And the journeytoforever.org is just a really interesting place to get a lot of this information. 
and uh, just uh, among colleagues and other people doing the same type of things we're doing. That's it. Can I add something? Certainly. I have uh, I have five heirlooms at home. Uh -huh. One of them is from Rattles, which is from uh, Australia, which has a uh, three tier. Then I have one wash machine tub. One wash machine tub. There, I don't know. One wash machine tub um, that I use with a um, piece of plywood on top and another wash machine tub similar. Then I use a 30 gallon barrel cut longitudinally. Mm -hmm. And then the two halves of the, that barrel, I drilled and put a drain in each one of them so that they wouldn't die in their own excrement. Right. You always need to have some kind of drains. So they can get away, and, uh, and the round bin also has um, the uh, drainage in the bottom of it. And uh, so those are just a few of the things. It's simple to make your own bin. It absolutely is. A uh, five gallon plastic bucket, mm -hmm. cut it in half, long, long ways, a little drain in the bottom. Yeah. Cover them. I use a piece of uh, plywood to cover them at the top, keep the light out, and just add. And you'll find, have your castings come right up to the top. You'll yep. have a uh, lot of stuff you can rake off. And then I put a uh, catch can underneath those 30 gallon uh, bins to catch my worm teeth. And it works very well. And uh, it's amazing all the different animals that you have inside of a worm bin. And you see grubs, you'll see beetles, there's yep. spiders, other things besides the worms. Yep. But they all seem to do well. They do. In fact, I, I had uh, years ago, I had a, an issue uh, with a worm bin, and I found these black flies in there. Mm -hmm. And I was really, I was killing them. So then I went online to one of the researchers that I happen to know, and he directed me to a fella. And next thing you know, I got a response from a, uh, a guy in uh, Brazil. One of the a researcher there about this, and they were the larva of a very beneficial. Um, I don't even remember what they were now. It's been so long, but there are people who raised them. I started doing more research in them, and there are people who raised them to sell. And I was killing them in my bin because I didn't know any better. But it's a, it's a black fly of some kind. They're pretty good size, and they'll fly away. But I, I thought they were killing my worms, but they're not. And I, I wish I could remember what they were. Amazing how many different things. I mean, I've got shrubs as big as my thumb inside of it. Yes. And little black beetles and brown beetles, all kinds of stuff. Well, you basically got compost is what you've got. It's at a higher level. It's at a higher level with the nutrient and all that in there. So anyway, thank you all. Thanks. Did anybody find their ticket? Mm -hmm. Anybody find that ticket? No, no one's found the ticket. What? Two, three, eight. That's that was fine. That's it. Come on. Nothing's going to stop. Nothing's going to stop. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you're going to pull from out of this. You should pull another ticket then. Can someone pull another ticket, please? Thank you. Uh, like Anybody have any questions? Or? Where do you get words? Hey, go on the internet and just type in. Two, three, nine. You got it? Yeah. Which one do you want? What do you want to do The same book. There? Yeah. Okay. 
Okay. Or if you're going to make your work easy, you know, try to move it with water, wouldn't it be a great thing to do to let that water in? You use that water. Either you can bring water on the water. I want to sit out for 24 hours and just think the corn just so I'm not feeling like all. Um, yeah, it'd probably be a very good idea. And not just that, you have to let the, what I used to do was put the um, compost, like say I had buckets of water sitting around my garden all the time. So rinse in my hands or doing anything. I would use water like that. Like you say, you let it sit. And that's a wonderful, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, but then I would take a, um, like a, almost like a stocking, put it into that and put it into the um, bucket. Now, I used to tell people I used to kick the bucket method. I'd be walking around the garden all day. I'd walk up, just kick the bucket to throw the water. Okay, so I used to kick the bucket method to make my worm tea. 24 hours later, you can use it. And after you, if you don't use it within 24 hours, it's no good. It loses strength. Now, there's researchers working on trying to improve that. And I think the one fella from New York may have done it. Because you'll see it for sale on store shelves. Don't buy it because it's only good for 24 hours. And when we brought that up at the at the one meeting, the fellow was really doing some heavy research into fixing that problem, but I don't know if they've done it. I'd be reluctant to buy anything that was already made. Okay. But that's how I would do it. You let 24 hours or so, let it sit over day, overnight and use that next morning. Use it immediately. Because it will not last. It'll get, it goes bad. It loses its value. Which is... My worm tea a little bit. I don't always put it on full strength. I, I just use it out of the bucket. I put a five gallon bucket, so maybe three, two thirds full or three quarters, almost so whatever, and about a pound of compost in a stocking, and put it right on there. That's just how I've always done it. You're saying the activity of worm the same as the living life has the It's all exactly. So the tea is that exactly. It's more of that than the nutrients, yes. Because those, those it's incredible stuff. It really is. It's some amazing, amazing stuff. For, it's amazing what it will do for a plant. I'm telling you, it's amazing. You go out there with a spray bottle, start spraying your plants, you'd be shocked what happens. I mean, it really, really makes a big difference. It also is um, really, really spread for pest control. For pest control, it works well too. There's a foliar spray as well. That's what I use it for, yeah. I normally foliar spray my plants anyway. Even when I use um, um, ammonia, I mean, uh, fish, fish emulsions, I, I spray the plants with it. I rarely put uh, new, uh, soil fertilizers down. When I plant new trees, I would do that. I'd put down a pound of uh, cottonseed meal or something like that in the soil when I dig it. But I don't normally use fertilizers on plants in the ground. I use them on foliar. That's just my preference. I think it works better personally. That's just me. You know. Anybody else? Well, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate you letting me do this. Thank you. Tell them what we have. We have caramelas, we have pizza. Oh, hopefully. Yeah. We have caramelas, we have several types of guavas, we have blue java bananas, and we have pizza. And so, I have a pizza. Pizza. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, on Zoom. Um, we'll put this recording up on. Yes, our YouTube channel that I started this weekend. We have a Twitter now, too. We haven't tweeted, but we have a Twitter. So if you're uh, high tech, you can follow us. If not, just be happy, I guess. But we're going to try to put up all of our club uh, meetings henceforth on the YouTube channel. I have uploaded all of last year's talks that we did on Zoom already. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay.